This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 159, recorded on August 23rd, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. The agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Nice to hear your voice. We're in the dog days of August, aren't we? Almost the end yeah, of absolutely. August. Can you imagine yeah. that summer is almost over? Oh, my God. It was just the yesterday. The whole year is almost over. I don't know where it went. Elio, it was just yesterday I was sitting with you in New Orleans having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> way back right. in June. Also joining us from small th- from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. I almost said you were from Small Things Considered. <laughs> no, not this week. But well, we did have the eclipse. We we had the eclipse, and that was my first total eclipse. Is, was it a to- totality where you are, or almost? It was totalitary. Ah, cool. And so it was very cool. Uh, the entire university left their offices and clinics, and we have this uh, urban farm right outside my office, and. Everybody was gambling on the lawn, and uh, we all had our uh, NASA uh, eclipse glasses that uh, the College of Charleston down the street has one of the space grant consortia, and NASA was broadcasting live from their campus, so they had something like a hundred thousand glasses that they were <laughs> passing out. So it was, it was quite something to see. I had never seen a total eclipse. I'd seen plenty of partial ones, but it really does indeed get dark. I heard also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. You only had a partial eclipse there, right? It was partial and we had a big cloud move in at <laughs> kind of a key oh, part. No. So we could, we could see little bits of it here and there, but I'm happy that it was a sunny day for you down there, Michael. That's cool. Yeah, I uh, our uh, TWIV co-host Dixon DePommier drove to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, oh. just just to see it, and he said it was just amazing when it went total because mm-hmm. it gets dark. But there's also some. It's not quite dark. I understand. I wouldn't know. That's what he said. Well, it's amazing how very partial. We only had about seventy percent, and best I can tell, there was no darkness at all. Mm. I mean, it didn't make any difference. So you can obliterate quite a bit of the sun and it stays <laughs> right. Yeah, that's amazing. I want to tell you about the ASM Hot Topics in Microbiology Education online course, which is designed to help you measure whether your students are truly learning in your classroom or laboratory. What you can do We're is just to, pretending they're learning. That's right. <laughs> you can figure it out. Uh, maybe we don't want to know if they're learning. <laughs> <laughs> but this course will help you learn. What you can do is design a research project uh, and learn how to gather and evaluate data to discover if your methods improve student learning. You can join an online community of supportive faculty, mentors, and facilitators who will work you through productive interactive assignments. Now, this is an online webinar, and it's highly affordable. It's going to take place from August through December 2017, and the deadline is coming up. August 28th, you can learn more at asm.org slash courses. Now, today, we thought in in lieu of a snippet of a paper, we would give you a snippet about someone we all know uh, very well who uh, has worked uh, for many years at ASM and recently uh, left for another position, Chris Kandayan. And he has touched all of us, and I thought we could just each chat a little bit uh, about how we, we knew Chris and how, how much we uh, loved his work. Elio, tell us about Well, 
uh, he is of course known as being the videographer for the ASM. And I, but I'd rather talk about another aspect of it, namely the origin of our blog, Small Things Considered. It turned out that way back, over almost 11 years ago, when I thought about writing for the general audience and so forth, I was told that there's such a thing as a blog, and I didn't even know how to spell it. But so I called Chris because Chris was knowledgeable in all things communication. He says, You wouldn't believe it. We've just been talking about it, and we would like to have a blog for the ASM. So, how about it? So, this became a marriage of great convenience. And Chris helped me set up. He got the software going. He explained to me how to do it. He held my hand like you wouldn't believe. And in general, he acted so kind, thoughtful, just an amazing guy. And so, I got, I have so much to thank him. And also, I have to thank him the, the title of the blog, which is his invention, Small ah. Things Considered. He made it up. And uh, actually, once I was on All Things Considered, and I asked him, do they mind if we use almost the same name? He said, not at all. It's fine with them. So anyhow, I have so much to be grateful to Chris for, I can hardly tell you. Michelle, how did you know Chris? In case anybody's just tuning in, Chris is alive and well. We're just, he's just left. He's moved on from ASM. <laughs> um, so I have gotten to know Chris in a number of settings, um, including Microbes After Hours, which is a science outreach program that we run at headquarters and bring in a scientist to give a talk. And we invite the public in to come in, have some refreshment and participate in the talk, ask questions. And then Chris is produces it and he records and makes it available live. And then we have people on Twitter can ask questions in real time. So I've um, seen his great work there and also helping with productions for the Academy, the American Academy of Microbiology. Um, he helped produce some um, great interviews with members of the leadership team um, that we use to promote our mission. So as Elio pointed out, um, Chris has always been great because he's he's reassuring when you're getting ready for the for the bit that he's going to record. He's enthusiastic and his ideas go well beyond the project at hand. So, for example, he's been really encouraging me in the um, interviews that I do with first authors that I describe um, here on our TWIM podcast, and he's wanting to make that a, a larger part of um, ASM's mission. So he's he's always thinking of new ways to communicate and get our word out to the public. And I'll, I, it was such a pleasure working with him, and I, I wish him well in his new position. Now, Michael, I think you and Chris go way back to the beginnings of microbeworld.org, right? We do. We do indeed. Um, and in fact, that's my first occasion to have encountered Chris. Chris was newly hired at ASM and Jay Grimes, the then communications chair of ASM, asked me to chair a subcommittee to stand up our public face uh, out to the world. What this year was, was this? This was like 2002. I have to go back because I remember it because of hurricanes. So I have to go <laughs> use the hurricane time time remembering device. And so this came out of one of our retreats. And Jay said, we, we definitely need to think about our public communications. And because it was shortly after 9-11 and we were really concerned, the public was concerned about microbes. And uh, Barbara Hyde, who some of you may Early listeners will remember the the former director of communications for ASM. She she brought Chris on uh, from his former position, and Chris was into all things communications. He had a rock band when he was younger, and I put a link to the show notes about Chris's rock band because you can get some of his his music if you're interested. But he was really well attuned to the the trends going on with the internet, which is why he was such a strong supporter of Elio's blog. Uh, he and I talked about the blog and I said, a blog is a very jealous mistress. She, she constantly wants to be <laughs> given new story ideas and it's, it's this constant uh, activity. And 
And Chris and I agreed that we needed a, a champion who could produce at least two quality pieces each week because that's what drives traffic to your site. And I remember he and I had a long discussion with our subcommittee about the need to to keep ASM's public communication site fresh and much of what uh, microbeworld.org was that many of you may have used to get your episodes of TWIM uh, and TWIV were a consequence of Chris. He, he wanted to do crowdsourcing of our communications efforts because sometimes people spot things in their local newspapers or they discover a really cool fungus in the woods. And he really wanted a crowdsource microbiology. And so much of what Ooh. ASM does well with communications is because of Chris's vision and really encouraging the volunteers as most of you who listen regularly to TWIM know, ASM is a volunteer based organization. We all volunteer our time here on TWIM and Vincent's friends on TWIV volunteer their time as well as do all the TWIM uh, or, or the TWIV or whatever the acronym is podcasts. And I think there's there's no higher praise than this opening piece from one of the books that Vincent recently gave away about cheese. And so I'll just read from the opening paragraph of the acknowledgments. Cheese is a topic which makes science and microbiology highly tangible. In 2009, I had the pleasure of delivering a lecture on the topic of Say Cheese, Understanding the Living Foods We Eat for the public program series, The Dish, at the Marion Koshland Science Museum of the National Academy of Sciences. Chris also produced some of those uh, series on behalf of our society. Before the lecture, and this is the author, Catherine Donnelly writing, before the lecture, Chris Condian, the outreach manager in the communications department at the American Society for Microbiology, conducted an interview as well as a taping during my presentation. Chris is a superb interviewer, and we had no problem enthusiastically discussing the topic of cheese and microbes for an hour. The interview became the basis of the microbe world video entitled Cheese and Microbes. Later that year, I received a call from Eleanor Reamer of ASM Press asking if I had an interest in compiling and editing a book, which became the work the book on cheese that ASM Press publishes uh, today. And I also put in the show notes that video, and uh, we also have a video of Chris uh, actually talking about communications that I'll put in the show notes as well, because he was truly a treasure, one of ASM's treasures, but he elected to move on to a, a new opportunity, and I'll be forever grateful for how he's helped me, uh, you know, bring science to life. And I think that's yeah. why many of you listen each time we put up a po podcast. We could Ilya? easily say that Chris is the father of social media for microbiology. Yeah, I sure. agree. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, a well-deserved statement. Chris has been really essential in helping to grow uh, the uh, – Twix family of podcasts this that week: virology, there. microbiology, parasitism, etc. Way back in 2005, I had started Twiv. It was about a year in, and I emailed. I think it was Tom Shank, and I said, "Is there any way ASM could help publicize this podcast?" And he said, "Sure. I, I I listened. I like it. Let me put you in touch with Barbara Hyde, who was director of communications." And she said, "We'd love to help." And she put me in touch with Chris, and Chris worked with me to. Uh, get more publicity to put the podcast on the ASM website. And after about 30 episodes, he said, why don't you come to the ASM general meeting it was going to be in Philadelphia that year. And this was episode 34. And he said, do a live episode, you know, just do it in, in front mm -hmm. of an audience. We'll live stream it. You can record it and release it. So I thought that was a great idea. That was our first live TWIV. There was a big room. Uh, Chris was there. Ray Ortega was there. And there was one person in the audience. <laughs> But we recorded the show, 
and we released it and it was great. And since then, of course, at almost every ASM it used to be called the general meeting, we've done live twibs and twims. And Chris is the producer. He runs the show. Uh, he does the live streaming and uh, he's just been incredible. I've worked with him so many times over the years. One of the other projects I really like besides ASM general meeting, we did the bio defense meeting and a number of other meetings as well. We had the opportunity to record a documentary at the BSL four in Boston. Oh yeah. The nice famous slide. needle episode. Yes, Threading the needle, a one hour documentary, which is wonderful because Chris and Ray were with us, of course, and I'll never forget the night before we'd all arrived and we were having dinner and, and Chris is at the table with a pad of paper. He said, okay, let's sketch out what, what we want to do. And he was always like that. He was always taking a hand and making sure you, you knew what you wanted to do, having good ideas, always enthusiastic, creative, uh, and, and really conscientious. I'm really sad that he's leaving uh, ASM. So am I. And, uh, Me too. I just hope he, he has a great time where he's going. We're going to miss him. We're going to miss his creativity. And um, the best of luck, Chris. We hope you enjoyed this little chat about you. Huge shoes to fill at ASM. Very tough. Yeah. I don't know if you've looked at the show notes, but I have a picture of Chris lifting a, a barbell. Yeah. Do you see that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. I think all our listeners need to check out the show notes. I'm going to put this picture somewhere. But basically, um, uh, at the science march again, so the TWIV team went to ASM headquarters, and Chris uh, put together a lovely uh, live stream TWIV episode. And I said, oh, "Let me send you a TWIV shirt." And he said, "Well, send me an exercise shirt, and I will exercise in it." <laughs> and then he t he had this picture taken of him <laughs> lifting a huge barbell, and it says, "Are you TWIV strong?" <laughs> <laughs> and that was his idea, right? So this is the kind of things he would just come up with, and. Always very creative. So thank you, Chris. Really and he brought su brings such joy to his work. I think that's what puts us at ease ah, and, and, well and encourages us. Yes, he's, yeah. he was well really into it. it. He loved it. He loved doing this. Right. We haven't heard the last from Chris, I'm sure. No. This uh, episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. We want to welcome them to TWIV, uh, TWIM and TWIV as a new sponsor. Imagine an everyday, inexpensive drone you could buy online, modified by terrorists to spread chemical or biological weapons over a crowded football stadium or maybe a holiday parade. Plague, VX, sarin, weaponized flu. How would we treat the victims? What could we do to counteract the effects? Or how could we prevent a scenario like this from happening? Join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with over 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem biodefense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. Please join us to share your important ideas. For more information and to register, go to cbdstconference.com. That's all one word, cbdstconference.com. You can also stay up to date with the latest conference information on Facebook. They have a page. You can just search for D-O-D-D-T-R-A. Or you can also follow them on Twitter, CBDST Conference. This 2017 CBDST Conference, Today's Innovation, Tomorrow's Warfighter Capabilities. We have a paper for you today, which um, is, a, is a kind of paper that could go for either TWIM or TWIV. Uh, involves right. bacteriophages, and it's all about a topic we have talked about quite a bit uh, here on TWIM Phage Therapy. The title of the paper, which was published in Cell Host and Microbe, Synergy Between the Host Immune System and Bacteriophages Essential for Successful Phage Therapy Against an Acute Respiratory Pathogen. And this comes from the Pasteur Institute and Georgia Institute of Technologies, technology. There are two first authors, 
Dwayne Roach and Chung Ying Leung, and the senior author uh, is Laurent Debardieu. No, Debardieu. Laurent Debardieu. Okay, so this is a pretty cool paper, which, uh, as I said, is about phage therapy using phages to try and limit bacterial infections. This has been thought about a long time. We've talked a bit a lot on TWIM. In fact, a good start is TWIM 53, which was a an episode we re- recorded live in Manchester along with Chris Kandayan, Ray Ortega. And uh, we had all experts on that panel who were interested in using phages to treat bacterial infections. Now, a number of human trials have been done with phages to treat infections, but they have mixed results. Some of them work, some of them don't work. It's not clear why. why. When they do work, why they're working, and when they don't work, why are they not? So it's not just as simple as the phages you give and they wipe out all the bacteria. That's not just it. There's something else, and that's what this paper is trying to sort out. So the model that they use, they they use a mouse model, and they infect the mice uh, intranasally with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a bacterial pathogen that causes pneumonia in patients with immune deficient immune defenses. So the idea here is that they're exploring classic cystic fibrosis. That's right. The idea here is that maybe having uh, not a good immune response is going to affect uh, whether phage therapy works or not. So they have mice, they, int- they introduce intranasally, the bacteria multiplying the lung, and within about 24 hours, the, the, mice, the mice die. Bacteria replicate extensively, and the, the animals die. And they have a phage, of course, which they're going to use. It's a Pseudomonas aeruginosa phage. Uh, it's a lytic, double-stranded DNA-containing phage. It's called PAKP1. It's been previously shown that if you give this phage to mice, it can clear Pseudomonas infections in the mouse lung. And they have engineered their pseudomonas strain in this study to produce a bioluminescent protein. And this is pretty neat. This bioluminescent protein comes from an insect bacterium. It just happens to produce a protein that's luminescent. So they've engineered it into pseudomonas. So why would you do that? Now you could actually look at bacterial growth in live mice. You don't have to to sacrifice them. You could just uh, use a, a light sensor And uh, you can measure the amount of growth. So you can see with time as the bacteria multiply, and you can see the effect of phages on that as well. It's pretty neat. The mouse is literally glowing. They are glowing. And you don't have to take our word for it. Panel A of the first figure (laughs) is an amazing (laughs) shot of the backs of these mice, and you can see where the bacteria are growing in the lungs or not. Yeah, Because if you think about it, if you wanted to measure the amount of bacterial growth, you'd have to sacrifice each animal take out the lungs and homogenize it, right? And then mouse is gone. (laughs) And this way you can take it and then put it back in its cage and it will live to see another day. Yeah, and check it the next day. So, for example, they do two hours, four hours, six hours, and it can watch progression with the same mouse. So it's very cool. So I think this is a really cool experiment. They So they give uh, intranasally the bacteria, and then two days later they give No, two hours, two hours. They give the the phage two hours after the infection. You sure it's two hours? I'm gonna uh, look, I'm gonna look here. After a two hour two hours, delay, yeah, a, it's two hours. Yeah, yeah. Why did I write two days? Two hours because two days because is that's their yeah. that's their scale. Two hours, and a multiplicity of infection of ten, <laughs> and within two hours, you can see the blue light, which is you know by these imaging of the bacteria going down. Two hours after phage infection, the number of the amount of blue light emitted starts to decrease, and by forty-eight hours, they can't see any more blue uh, light coming out of these animals. That's remarkable. And it, the, what I think is remarkable is that you're just putting it in the nose of the mice, and it's a phage, and it's managing to spread down into the lungs and infect the bacteria. And as I said, the, if you don't treat mice with bacteriophage, they're dead in in a day or so. So this is quite remarkable. So that is that is the starting point for this whole paper. And the cool thing about this paper, in addition, is that they also use mathematical models to predict uh, what's going to happen when you put phages into the lungs of these mice. So they have models that say, you know, how how the phage will replicate when we put the, the phage in, in the lungs of mice, and they can predict 
how the clearance is going to go. And one of their models predicts phage clearance uh, by one hour. Of course, this is not what they see. It takes about 48 hours or so to clear. And so they think, well, we're, we're missing something from our mathematical model. And they say, well, probably there are two things that are missing. One of the things is that there's spatial heterogeneity in the lung, right? There are barriers mm-hmm. to infection. You're not just putting phage into a solution of bacteria where all the bacteria can be infected. A lung is a complicated place, and the phage may not be able to find the bacteria. So they model that into their mathematical model. And then they also model the fact that you might be getting multiple phage in attaching to a single bacterium. And when they model those two things in separately, they now get clearance in about uh, 24 hours, which is more it's closer to what they see in mice. So they have a model that they can now can use to interpret some of their, their, their results in mice. Pretty cool. And um, they vary absorption rate and the density, and they're able to identify a, a region of concentration of phage where you get synergistic clearance of bacteria. The next thing they did was to model into their equation what would happen if bacterial mutants emerged that were resistant to phage killing. And that happens of a lot. course the big bugaboo of it is. Uh, phage therapy, right? Yeah. Well, if, if any microbial antimicrobial therapy. Yes. We of worry course. about resistance. Yeah. Right. Resistance happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so they add this to their model, their mathematical model. They also added in a 10% fitness cost, right? So they're saying, oh, let's say the bacteria have a little are a little sicker if even if they're resistant to the to the phage. And their model says you can still get clearance even if you get resistant bacteria. So that this made them think that maybe the host immune response is um, playing a role here because, you know, if you're getting mutants, why aren't they overtaking the population? So maybe the host immune response is involved. And that's what they're going to be looking at uh, for the rest of this paper. Now, they they focus on innate immunity because the whole clearance is very rapid, right? Innate immunity is what happens very quickly after infection. And adaptive immunity would take up to two weeks later. So that is probably not what's at play here because, remember, the clearance happens between a day or two uh, after infections. So we know that innate immune responses to pathogens are initiated when sensors in the host sense the presence of something foreign. And these are typically toll-like receptors. There are other kinds of, of sensors as well. But they focus on toll-like receptors, which are known to recognize bacterial proteins. And a, and a central, what happens is a toll-like receptor will recognize, say, lipopolysaccharide, and then a signaling pathway will be activated, resulting in the products of the innate immune response. And a central protein is a, in this whole process is, a protein called MyD88. And mice have been available for a number of years now that lack the gene for MyD88. So they took these, they infect them with their pseudomonas, and of course they're even more susceptible to infection because they can't mount any innate responses to infection. They give phage to these mice. All right, so they infect these MyD88 null mice with pseudomonas, and they give them phage. The bacteria are cleared. Mice still die at 24 hours and all the bacteria they recover from those mice are resistant to the bacteriophage. That must've been a great day in the lab. That's a cool result, when you right? you got an explanation for your yeah, kinetics. It's I mean, very cool. and this is right away, there's some kind of interaction with the immune response and, and the, uh, the phage. It's incredible. And then they went to their models and they confirmed this. They said, well, if we take away the immune response, which could be done in their model, you would also predict the outgrowth of phage-resistant bacteria. So if you take away the innate immune response, the phage-resistant mutants overwhelm the immune defenses. Well, Vincent, Hmm. I I was wondering, um, this is in the family of of the P1 phages, and this, this may be a little bit too much inside baseball, but I didn't see it in their commentary. The family of P1 phages are interesting in that they have two complete sets of tail fiber genes, each conferring a different host range. Mm. And the genes are arranged 
in an opposite orientation in the phage genome with a single control region. And so it's almost like phase variation in salmonella that we teach to medical students about, you know, how they avoid, uh, how salmonella avoids the immune system. And, and it literally just flops back and forth. But since they selected a completely lytic phage that never went through lysogeny and the way this uh, flipping of the tail fiber genes that confers a different, if you will, adaptive immune profile to the phage. They didn't comment on it. So I'm, I'm wondering if they looked at that particular trait because it makes sense that if their phage were going through a lysogenic component, they would see the flipping of the tail fibers, which would then make the organism resistant mm. um, to the phage. Yeah, they, I don't know the answer. They do mention that they they pick this uh, phage because it's dom- predominantly lytic, at least in this system. And so maybe that's not an issue going into lysogeny, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, other than that, I don't know uh, Yeah. To address it. They took this result and they, they looked at their mathematical model and they said, let's model in different levels of immune activation and see what happens. So without MyD88 is zero immune activation, then you can go up to 100%, which would be wild type mice. And then let's model in, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40% and see what happens to the ability of the phage to get rid of bacteria in the lungs. And they found that you need at least 20% immune activation to eradicate phage sensitive bacteria in the lungs. So you you don't need a hundred percent, but you need at least 20%. And that's just for phage sensitive bacteria. Okay. Next they ask what cells are important for this effect of the immune response on phage therapy. They use, they can use mice that lack a number of immune cells. They have mice that lack T cells, B cells, and innate lymphoid cells. These are cells like NK cells. And they do their experiment. They infect with pseudomonas. They had phage. And it works just fine. Phage therapy mm-hmm. works just fine if you don't have B cells, T cells, and innate lymphoid cells. That's amazing. <laughs> but when what? they... Killing yeah. bacteria. It's killing bacteria. So you would hope it would work. And But the thing is, T cells and B cells, of course, take a lot longer yeah. to... But I'm surprised the innate lymphoid cells are not playing a role because, you know, NK cells are part of the innate immune response, but they're apparently not, at least not in mice, right? Yeah, they do point out that there are some differences between mice and, and humans. humans. So they're, they're right. a little cautious about extrapolating right. to right. humans. That's right. However, if they take away neutrophils, then the phage no longer works, all right? And we know that neutrophils are important for uh, clearing bacterial infections. We've talked about those uh, quite a few times on TWIM. So the I think this is very interesting because that if you have neutropenia, in other words, if you have low levels of neutrophils, and we know that this happens at least in respiratory disease, it might be that phage therapy won't work. Uh, they go into a little discussion of neutropenia, that is the condition where you have low levels of neutrophils, comes in different severities. There's some people with between 12 and 23% of the level of neutrophils of a normal person. They have a slightly increased risk of infection, but once you go below 5%, you have a high risk of severe infection. These are in people in, in ob- observational studies. And their models, they go into their computer models again, and they predict that you need at least 50% neutrophil levels to get successful phage therapy. And even without bacterial resistance, you still need 20% neutrophils. So that's interesting, okay? So wild-type bacteria, which are completely sensitive to phage, it it will not clear the infection unless you have neutrophils at 20% or so. (laughs) That's really, that's quite interesting. You know, this, uh, I may be jumping the gun a little bit, but, and they mentioned this uh, later on, but this is also true for antibiotics. If you only depend on antibiotics, you're not going to kill, you're going to hit, heal anybody. Yes. This is seen, for instance, in AIDS patients. Uh, without an immune system, antibiotics won't work. 
or they, they will work marginally. Mm -hmm. So that here again, it's a synergy between the immune system and probably the the uh, innate immune system, especially and the antimicrobial agent, whether it's phages or antibiotics. So the history history repeats itself here. Do you think it's that's a question of accessibility of the antimicrobial to get to the popula every cell in the population, or rather, is a subset of the population refractory um, because its cell wall is different or something? Well, there's there's always a fraction of the population that's not growing, and those mm -hmm. are effectively the um, mm. cells that are effectively just sitting there, and they're refractory to antibiotics. And they they will always be there, which is why you can never have absolute clearance. And they may also be resistant to viruses, to phages. Yeah, for the same right. reason. Mm. The receptor is masked in a in a per subset of the population, or something. Or the phage have bound to something else, which gets back into the multiplicity of infection, because there's tenfold as many phage. And the phage are trying to seek out and find. What do you mean, them for as many phage were? What are, they're, they're, what are you referring to? Well, remember, this model is based on the fact that you're getting exponential expansion of your uh, drug. You're, you're administering the drug once, which is the phage. And then the target that you're trying to kill is not only dying, but at the same time making more of the effective yeah. intervening agent. Right. And that's in the math of their model. And that's where it gets a little bit, um, they, they add that growth potential and it's all about burst size at that point in time. I don't know if you were going to get to that, Vincent. No, I wasn't going to include that, but um, I think that's an important point that this is a drug which amplifies itself, right? Because it's, it's self-renewing. Yes. It's self-renewing. Yeah, and so it Well, and then it also clears, self-clears once the target population is gone. Yeah, and actually that's a good point. The, the clearance of the phage is, is perhaps not as great as you would think. They do, they do a study because they want to know next if you could prophylactically treat, in other words, give phage before infection. And they do a study to see if you just give mice phages without bacteria, they go away at about half a log a day. So, you know, if you give 10 to the ninth phages, they can stick around for quite a few days. Right. And then, so that's interesting that the, it's a very slow elimination of phage. And so that's probably part of the efficacy. Uh, in, but that in was just in the lung. It's just that in the was, lung. That's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. I, I was wondering if that kinetic still applied intraperitoneally if you were to administer yeah. it. IP yeah. or whether it would go IV because the phage are typically cleared uh, by the reticular endothelial system. Oh, yeah. In, in the blood, they'd be gone within hours, right? Yeah. They'd be filtered yeah. out. Yeah. But what they found is very interesting. You could uh, give phage to mice up to four days before bacterial challenge and the phage still prevent pneumonia. And that is something their models also predict as well. And the cool thing is the multiplicity is 0.1 which is a hundredfold lower than the curative treatment dose. And they say, well, that's probably because the phage have a long half-life in the lung and they're amplified by replication. As Michael pointed out, these are self-amplifying. Well, they're not self, but they're infecting the host, of course, and, and uh, amplifying. They're, they also want to know, and this is an interesting question, do the phages themselves activate the immune response? All right. Is there some potentiation? So they give uh, phages, to mice, no bacteria, just phages, 10 to the ninth phages into the lung, and they measure the cytokines that are produced. And they find there's no increase in cytokines if you give mice phages or phosphate-buffered saline. So the phage is, is tolerated immunologically, but they do say that maybe elsewhere in the body it would be different. And, the, you know, if you put it in the blood, I bet it would be very different. And probably the phage makes a difference as well. But that's one of their cooler figures. This is, for those of you who have access to the paper, it's it's figure six, and their control is LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Right. And you don't even have to know what LPS does. It's just there in red going, red <laughs> alert, 
We are <laughs> activated all these cytokines. Danger, danger, danger. That's right. And LPS is sensed by a toll-like receptor. Yes. So it's, it's, you know, it's binding a toll-like receptor and it starts a signaling pathway, which goes through my D88, and then you get the production of all these cytokines, right? And LPS knocks them up really high and, and phage does nothing, which is actually surprising. I thought it would. So it's not being sensed at all. And I would have liked to have seen that same heat map done with the phage in the presence of their target bacterium. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I would guess once the phage lice the first you know round of bacteria, they dump all their microbial products, and yeah. that should yeah. trigger a pretty nice cytokine response. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Lysing them. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. That would be good. And I guess you the control would also be just bacteria, right? To make sure that. Yeah. Yeah, re- be the- like phage-resistant bacteria yeah. mm. mixed. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing they show, which is important, is that in mice with intact innate immunity, wild-type mice, it's not clearing the phages. They can compare wild-type with MyD88 mice, and there's no difference in the clearance rate of the phages. So innate immunity is not clearing the phages. But, you know, we worry about adaptive immunity clearing phages. You know, if you do long-term phage treatment, multiple phage uh, inoculations, we worry that you're going to have, for example, antibody responses. And they note that mm. if you give mice repeated phage doses, they do make antibodies, but people tend not to do that. And they say that's something that needs to be investigated. Now, Michael, I know you've thought about this in your previous incarnation. Ah, uh, yes. This, this idea that people don't make antibodies after repeated doses, is that right? Mm, we were worried about it a lot. I'm sure. Because that that's the whole basis behind gene therapy and adenovirus. Mm-hmm. But phage are a different creature. And w- when we were doing our phage work, we purposefully looked for phages that were non-immunogenic and had long persistence rates in the bloodstream. So mm-hmm. you can actually – this is in the lung. Yeah, sure. This is this is yeah. in the lung, which is really, if you consider it, the lung is actually outside the body because it's not, you know, the lung is effectively exposed tissue. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that the yeah. the uh, use of uh, viruses for gene therapy, which you mentioned, it's a you always have to worry if you want to give more than one dose. If you say give an adenovirus or an adeno associated virus, you give a dose, you get really good antibody responses, and you can't use the same kind of virus. Again, you have to use a different antigenic type. And so people are using very clever approaches to make new antigenic types of these viruses so they could you could have multiple inoculations if you need to. But this is different. As Michael says, a phage is a different beast. <laughs> Well, it's it's in a bacterium, and, and I think that goes back to that one figure about looking at whether or not the phage by themselves are activating the various cytokines of the immune system, yeah. which would then report whether they're effectively evading the surveillance system that evolution has given us to protect us against pathogens. Right. And we probably don't consider phage a pathogen, so yep. it, <laughs> it was there was no selection for it. It's got to be an antigen, though. Right. There's it's definitely an antigen because you can, of course, make antibodies against phage. Yeah. Well, they say that mice do readily. Right. Oh, yeah. And rabbits you- probably do as well. So that's this paper. Why I think it's cool is that they show that there's this connection between the immune system and phages in that if you want phage therapy to work, you have to have a good immune system. All right. Um, and so that is one reason I think it's important. The other one is a is a subset of that in which they find that you get resistant bacteria emerging, that is bacteria resistant to the phages, but it's only a problem in immunodeficient hosts. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Even yeah, without, I, thought, I bac- thought that was really good news. That's so cool. So mm-hmm. even without mm-hmm. bacterial resistance, though, you still need an immune response, an innate immune response to clear the infection. So, I, so now, Alia, you you said before this is known for antibiotics, that you need a good immune response. But I guess this is the first time this has been shown for phage therapy. That's why it's a, it's a novel observation. It's, it's amazing, actually, that this has not been found earlier because so many attempts have been made with phage therapy and they 
always seem to be sort of hitting a wall of some sort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, they work, but uh, so we're not that, you know, we're, we're not at the point where you can use phase therapy on a large scale at will. And uh, it's very puzzling what it is. Well, the Aliava Institute out of Tbilisi, Georgia, has their approach to phage therapy is they use a mixed cocktail. Right. So you get so you get around yeah. the uh, issue of persister cells and emergent mutants because you always have a phage that can potentially attack your particular target. And from the FDA standpoint, that was always very troubling for them. And then Merrill back in uh, the mid nineties was the one who was the, um, I guess the dogma that it's that the innate immunity may be sufficient for rapid clearance of phages from circulation, which when we were working on phage therapy, uh, we weren't using the exponential approach. We were just effectively giving the phage as a molecular syringe. Mm to effectively address some of the inherent issues. And it was it was a very interesting problem. And I, I really appreciated the level and rigor with which they had conducted their math. My only quibble is our institution doesn't subscribe to the journal, so I couldn't get access to the supplemental section. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't know what their actual math beyond their, their methods math in the online version that I saw actually said. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, one of the significant points about this is that maybe when you do a clinical trial in people, obviously with phages, you have to make sure that everyone you have in the trial has a, you know, a good immune response. You have to make sure mm. they're not neutropenic, for example. Right. Right. Another variable yep. you need to control. What I loved about the paper is the interaction between the phage biology the mm. bacteriology, and then the immune system, right. and them going back and forth between and animal model experiments and their math modeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, the, the synergy between the math computational biology and the animal model was really terrific. Great, great illustration of the um, power of those two processes to work together. They have a name for this. They call it immunophage synergy. Uh, it I makes think that's sense. a fine name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Immunophage synergy. Okay. All right. Let's do a few emails before we wrap up this episode. Uh, the first is from Alex who writes, I was listening to TWIM 149 on my bike ride to work this morning and would just like to express my complete support of all the arguments in favor of M Sphere's direct way of publishing discuss in the episode. That was our episode with Pat Schloss, I guess, right? Where he yeah. talked about his experience mm -hmm. with uh, uh, you. You can submit your paper to the reviewers and get the reviews, and then send it to Msphere. That's called Msphere Direct, I think. Right. We had also recently published our first Zika virus paper via Msphere Direct, uh, and he gives a citation. I couldn't be happier with the process. The whole process, from emailing the paper to reviewers, and the acceptance by the journal, took less than a month. And then the, pub the paper was published online within two weeks after acceptance. It was crucial for us to be able to do this quickly so we could add this paper to our grant rebuttal. <laughs> 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 this would be very difficult, impossible to do via traditional journal reviewing processes for a paper that was not even completed at the time of grant submission, as the time between grant submission and rebuttal here is usually less than three months. Some could say that this process is biased, but having the names of the reviewers listed on the title page of the paper and the complete transparency of the whole process, in my opinion, eliminates this issue. In our case, the reviews were as thorough as they would be via traditional reviewing processes, but without nasty comments that one would sometimes get from <laughs> negative reviewers. <laughs> Reviewer three. That's right. I also like the discussion on the benefits of preprint publications, particularly for younger researchers, being able to send a link to the preprint article would be a much better way of providing evidence of expertise experience for the job and grant applications. I would predict that other journals will soon follow Msphere. Hopefully this will not overwhelm prospective reviewers, as I can see that some of them may be quite popular. All the best from a winter Brisbane, where the weather is currently 22 Celsius and sunny with puffy clouds. And Alex Kromik is a professor of virology 
at the University of Queensland. Uh, the next one is from Stephen. Hi, Vincent, Alio, and Michelle. Just a few thoughts inspired by Alio's interesting snippet on moon milk. When I heard the term, I expected Alio to say moon milk was mostly composed of calcium sulfate, gypsum, plaster of Paris, because a particularly pure and beautiful crystalline form is called selenite. After the Greek for the moon, it's easy to imagine mm-hmm. that similar deposits in caves below gypsum containing strata, as with the bus sized crystals in the giant crystal caves, would have been called moon milk, as miners would have assumed that to be a likely source. It was not too much of a setback to hear that this mushy substance was, in fact, calcium carbonate, because it can be quite hard to tell the difference between crystalline calcium carbonate, as in Iceland spar, and calcium sulfate, as in selenite. You can scratch selenite with your thumbnail, but not calcite. And early peoples would be likely to have applied the same name. We call blackboard chalk calcium carbonate even today, but it is gypsum. In fact, Wiki tells us that before the 1500s, selenite would have meant any clear crystal because they were thought to wax and wane with the moon. Only in the 1500s did the name get affixed to what we now call selenite. I'd hazard a guess that this ties in with the development of chemistry and the need to specify the clear crystal with the properties you need. Gypsum for plaster, Iceland spar, calcite for optical polarizers in the new science of optics. When you go into caves with stalactites and stalagmites, you will notice that the walls are usually coated with similar deposits, but in more laminar form. It's easy to imagine that in very damp but not regularly flooding caves, there would be a biofilm on the surface that would have to keep moving up to avoid being permanently set in stone. I can further imagine that if there was enough nutrient available, the microbes might grow thick and fast enough to maintain a mush rather than allowing the usual buildup of the beautifully striped layers we see in cut and polished cave deposits. You previously covered the snotties, I believe. I can imagine these would be the result of microbial films growing where there are less of the concretionary, sparingly soluble salts available, but a range of possible forms seems likely between the moon milk mush and the snotite. Snotite. I said snotties. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be <laughs> snotties. Thinking uh, of the finely striped deposits and microbes together reminds me of the structure of stromatolites. And though these are marine, I wonder if your moon milk researchers have compared the microbes in the two forms. Certainly stromatolites have been around longer than almost any other living thing, and there should be some ancient genes to find there. This little train of thought further leads to another interesting transition from moon to sun, because it turns out that the optical qualities of Iceland's spar are thought to have led it to being used by the Vikings as sunstone, through which they could detect the polarization of sunlight and hence the direction of the sun, even when behind clouds or below the horizon. Hmm. You see what interesting trails one can follow from savoring a new word or a snippet. Incidentally, in the UK, you would find a few orange cup fungi, though not usually at the height of summer. Has it rained a lot in your garden lately? Now, the, he's mentioning the orange cup fungi that I mentioned. Yeah, there are two or three species of Pizza called orange peel fungi in the UK and a smaller, rounder little beauty we call eyelash fungus because the orange disc has a fringe of brown lashes around the rim. When you are looking at your soil and the plants in your... Black. Black? Yeah. You would black. probably likely like to have a good 20x hands lens on a thong around your neck to get really c- close up and appreciate the fine structures of nature. The miniature cup fungi often have delicate fringes or rims of droplets, and you'll be amazed at the enormous variety of hairs everything is covered with. Mm. Hmm. All the best to you and your team. Oh, and serendipitously in Luton, where he lives, I'm just up the road from Anna in Harpenden, who won your book this week. I don't know her. (laughs) I don't know her, but there are some marvelous fungi on the golf course there. And it is the home of the famous Rothamsted Research Station, which is still running one of the world's longest running experiments, begun 1856 and was the home of John Laws, who more or less invented artificial fertilizer. Weather rather wet and windy, more like winter than early August at the moment. And he gives a bunch of links for all the things that he told us. Great. Thank you. How That's interesting. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, we'll do uh, one more here. Oh, we'll do two more because they're both cool. One is from Mike. Hi, Twimmers. I enjoyed the discussion of Johan's question on Twim 157, and that was, what should I study to become a microbiologist, especially Alio's advice to study math? I'd like to turn that question on its head, though, and ask my own version. I'll be finishing my Ph.D. in statistics this winter with my research focused on bioinformatics for microbial ecology, and I'll be starting a postdoc in a microbiology lab after defending. 
I'm quite fortunate because it's a strong group with a great track record, and I've enjoyed all my interactions with the PI so far. I'm a bit nervous, though, because I have not taken a single biology class since ninth grade. Uh Uh-oh. And while I've naturally learned a lot in the course of my research, it's mostly been self-directed with a lot coming from Wikipedia. Actually, I've arguably learned more biology from TWIM than anywhere else, so a big thank you to you folks. <laughs> I I was clear about this when I interviewed, though, and I'm definitely comfortable with biological sequence data and programming, so I shouldn't be totally lost. But it's still an open question to me. What minimum level of basic training is needed to be able to hang with 15 microbiology PhDs? So I'm wondering, what advice would you have for someone in my situation? What are the most important things to be familiar with before starting? I think a good textbook is a good place. I want to quote a pertinent quote. I want to ask Wally Gilbert, who you may recognize, a Nobel Prize winner, was one of the very mm-hmm. earliest people who invented DNA sequencing and who started life as a physicist. And I asked him exactly this question. I said, what's it like? to go from physics and become biology. And he gave me a very interesting answer. He says he had only a student once. Mm. In other words, he said, the process that you go through to become a physicist is enough, has enough moment, has enough uh, substance that you can translate that process into anything else. In other words, you don't have to start over. That, I think, is the Mm. message. You certainly have to learn facts. You have to learn numbers. You have to learn names. Terminology. Mm. That's a great point. It's not like starting over. Yeah, I think that's great. Starting at a very different level. You know, Harold Varmus, the Nobel laureate, was an English major in college. So Mm. it's the same. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's learning. You learn how to learn, and then you can just pick up any field. So I would say, listen to Twim and read a, read, read the textbook <laughs> called Microbe, right? That, that's yeah, what I was going to say. Mm. A shameless plug for two of its authors. <laughs> and ASM. I agree. A textbook just to have as a reference. So when you hear a term at lab meeting, people discussing their work, you could go back and on your own, read the relevant sections and begin to build the yeah. framework yeah, yeah. That, that then it is easier to add to. All right, I have one more for you from Meika, who writes, Dear Twimsters, I have had this letter on my mind for a while, but I apparently cannot get pen to paper as quickly as I want. I am a horse trainer, an avid listener of all episodes of Twiv, Twim, and Twip. You help me remember my past scientific life, even as I am immersed in farm life. As non sequitur as it seems, the copper revolution has even infiltrated the horse world. Horses step in all kinds of crap, literally. Horse (laughs) horse owners battle foot health all the time, and people have fretted for millennia about this little horseshoe problem because you know the age-old saying, for want of a foot, the war was lost. (laughs) Anaerobic bacteria can wreak havoc on the quality of the hooves and cause things like thrush and white line disease. In the last year, farriers, the name for the professionals who not only nail shoes on my horse's hooves, but they help keep a balanced hoof to keep the horse sound, they have started to use copper-coated nails. Hmm. Here's a photo Hmm. of them. Here's two wonderful photos of these copper-coated nails in a horse hoof. (laughs) It was a bizarre meeting of the interests of my life to see copper antimicrobial technology hit the horse-shoeing world. As ever, thanks for keeping my science alive, even though I am a farmer. Isn't that Cool. cool? How lovely, my goodness. Lovely that photos. Just, it warms the cockles of my heart to know that we can <laughs> reach people in such different fields. So, Michael, you could add that to your uh, talk on I, copper. I, I certainly will. And I have two beautiful <laughs> images that they forwarded on to us. Very nice. All right. That is uh, TWIM 159. You can find it at Apple Podcasts. You can find it at asm.org slash TWIM. And of course, if you have a a smartphone or a tablet, there are applications that you now use to listen to podcasts. You can just find Twim and subscribe to it so that you get every episode as we release them. And if you like what we do, please consider giving us a financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute, where we have different ways you can help us, for example, through Patreon or contributions and other ways as well. We'd be eternally grateful for your support. And also, of course, don't forget Send in your questions and comments. Even if you've thought about them for over a year, 
put your hands on that keyboard and just send <laughs> us. It's very easy. You can just send your email to twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Elio Schechter is at the wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Thank you. My pleasure. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. We have to thank everyone for continuing to do podcasts through the dog days of August when they might be wanting to do someone else. I really appreciate it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of Twim and Ray Ortega for his technical help. I also want to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The music you hear on Twim is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.